Welcome to Christ Chapel College, the college outreach of Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We hope everyone experiences what Jesus calls abundant life. So we unapologetically point to Him as the source of life and joy. If you're a college student in the Fort Worth area, we'd be stoked to connect with you. Find out more at ChristChapelCollege.org and on Instagram at Christ Chapel College. Man, I got to say, this is awesome, though. This room is packed, and I honestly just can't believe it's the last Sunday that we're all going to be gathering here until next fall, and I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little, little scinty, um, especially you seniors in the room. I'm sure y'all are kind of in that place, too, but I promise I won't get too emotional today. Um, I don't know. I can't actually promise that, but uh, we'll see. Hey, um, we're going to be in John chapter 15 today, so if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and flip there. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, especially going into the summer, Bibles are in the back of the room. Take one. There's some black ones. There's some purple ones. That's our gift to you. Um, otherwise, we're going to have scripture up on the screen later, so um, take one if you want. But I was, uh, as I was preparing for today and this sermon, I was kind of thinking through, man, what was it like when I was in college? I came to TCU, too, and what was it like before going into summer break and going into really any break. What was it like to go back home? Um, what was it like to go? I spent a lot of summers working at a camp. There was one summer where um, I just spent working to save up money to buy my wife's uh, ring, which was fun. But so I did a lot with my summers and with my breaks, but I was kind of reflecting on what that looked like. And then even for seniors in this room, reflecting on what it looked like to transition out of college and into, you know, the, uh, the adulthood life. And I was thinking about it and I feel like I, I quickly learned a couple things with my experiences on breaks, whether it was going home or working um, with an internship or going to work at a camp, a couple things happened. Specifically when I went home, I, I feel like I would come here. I fell in love with Jesus in college. I didn't know Jesus when I uh, was growing up. I felt like I believed in God, but I didn't really start a relationship with Jesus till I was here at TCU. But I would go back home after all this growth in my relationship with the Lord and, and developing my faith and learning about Jesus and getting into really good habits of like studying his word every morning and or at least consistently um, and praying and spending time just sitting with Jesus. And then I would go back home to San Angelo, Texas, which is just dirt and cotton about four hours down the road. And it, all that kind of went away. It was like it just went out the window and I kind of reverted back to who I was in high school. I developed my old ways again. It, all the sin that I felt like I did a good job of kind of slowly diminishing out of my life and, and kind of getting rid of just seemed to take an uptick when I went back home, developed old rhythms and old patterns. The Bible that I packed in my bag with every intention of reading and studying just stayed at the bottom of my bag. And that was one experience of like, wow, why, why does that always happen? And then another thing that I realized, especially when I worked at um, a camp or was doing things for Jesus, it became very easy for me, and I'm guilty of it this week too, um, very easy for me <clears throat> to, let's say I'm spending the entire summer teaching God's word, or like today I'm teaching it, and I'll spend a lot of time in his word, but I'm never just actually sitting with the Lord on my own for my own nourishment and my own soul. So all these things happen to me, and I was thinking about it, and it's like, cool, we're, we're all going to run into that here this summer, right? I think the summer is a subtle but formative time in our lives, especially in college, and I think there's a lot that can happen in it. And to kind of kick this off, I'm going to throw John 15, 11 on the screen. Um, we'll kind of unpack the rest of the passage later, but I want to start here. It says, this is Jesus speaking. He's saying, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So we have that. We have John 10, 10. It's a verse we throw around a lot here that says, Jesus is saying, I came to give you life and life to the full. So in a relationship with Jesus, these things are promised to us. In Christ, they're ours. But I think at all times, but specifically over summer, we tend to leave those things on the table and we don't actually experience them. And we leave joy on the table. We leave life and life abundant on the table. And there's a few reasons why I think we do that. And that's kind of what we're unpacking today. And I think there's a couple traps <clears throat> that we're susceptible to always, kind of throughout the year, but I think specifically in the summer or any, any kind of break, whether you're going home, you've got an internship, you're going to work at a camp, you're studying abroad, whatever. I think there, there's these traps that are, um, we are likely to fall into. And the first one is kind of like what I talked about. First one is that we just fall back into old rhythms and habits. Very easy to do. Um, for whatever reason, when we get away from here, 
and away from this normal, consistent rhythm of life that we've got for us, or maybe not so consistent, and we are in another place, we just tend to revert and fall back into old sin habits, old sin patterns, whatever it might be. And so that's one trap. The second one, very closely tied to it, is that we just fall ap- into apathy and complacency. Meaning we go home, and this was my experience at least, I'll go home and my, like I said, my Bible would stay at the bottom of my bag untouched. And I kind of would just coast through my time at home because I'm with my old friends, I'm with my family, and things are really comfortable and easy. Or I'm developing a new rhythm and I just kind of grow lazy in my faith and forget to actually be intentional with pursuing Jesus and growing my faith. And so that's the second trap. The third one is kind of tricky um, and also very subtle. The third one is that we grow too dependent on community. This community is sweet. And I think biblical community, I believe, is one of the best gifts that God gives us to grow in our relationship with Jesus, right? The fact that we can all link arms and do life together here is amazing, and it's rare. I believe that, and I think what we have here at TCU and in Fort Worth is very rare. But with that, I think the trap that we can fall into is we grow dependent on it, and we don't develop our faith as our own, right, as individual individuals pursuing a relationship with Jesus, and we, we just affiliate with a crowd who does, and so whenever that crowd leaves us, or that community leaves us, or we are removed from that community, then it, we realize, oh crap, I never developed this and made my faith my own, authentically, and that's just a subtle trap, and, the, and then the fourth one, also very subtle, um, that I kind of alluded to, and this one's tricky, is that we become too busy doing things for Jesus, that we just forget to simply sit and be with Jesus, Um, like I was saying earlier, even this week, I'm studying for this sermon, right? And so I'm looking at John 15 basically every day, reading it, studying it, you know, doing all these, um, reading commentaries on it and everything. And so it's easy for me to be like, oh yeah, I spent all day in God's word. Like, look at me, I'm a good Christian. But I didn't actually just take time away, cut away from just studying it to teach it and preach it and just simply sit with it and let it nourish my soul. And so those are the traps that we can fall into, And the question we're tackling today is, what do we do about that? What do we do about all this? Because I'm sure one of those, if not all of those, we can all fall into, or we've all at least experienced, right? So that's kind of what we're going to tackle today, and we're unpacking John 15, 1 through 11 to do so. So um, if you haven't already opened up John 15, starting in verse 1, um, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. Um, let's stop right there. Actually, let's, let's keep reading. Abide in me, and I in you. This is verse 3. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And we'll stop right there. Okay, abiding. Uh, That's a word you may or may not be familiar with, right? Um, And it's a word that if you are familiar with it, you can probably agree it gets tossed around a bunch from the church stage, from your small group, whatever it is. And it gets tossed around a lot, but it's actually kind of hard to define. It's kind of really heady in a sense and really hard to explain real practically, real tangibly, what it actually is and what it, what it looks like. So to start, I'm just going to simply define abide from you. And honestly, depending on what copy of scripture you have, it might say this, but first and foremost, it means to remain or to stay, to remain in or to stay in. So when you see abide, think remain or stay, a continuance in. Um, If you study the word in its original language, it comes from the same root that gives us the word abode, like my humble abode, my crib, the place where I live, Um, the place where I dwell. So another definition of it is just a dwelling. And so it's a continuance in. And the the way it's being used here is saying to continue in, here to continue in a daily personal relationship with Jesus. And that's what this whole passage is about. And that's the question that we're tackling of how do we continue in a daily personal relationship with Jesus? How do we abide daily? Um, But with that said, there's a definition. I'm going to give us just a few different ways that we can think of abiding a little more clearly. And the first one is that abiding is connecting. Abiding is connection to Jesus. Also, note takers, you're going to love today. I feel like I have a bunch of notes for you. Um, abiding is connecting. So we see, we see that 
he, uh, Jesus right here, is calling himself the vine, uh, saying his father's the vine dresser. We see this illustration of branches and leaves and fruit and all that kind of stuff. And he gives us this illustration of a vine, and there's a ton of reasons why. There's a lot going on here. Um, he's talking to his disciples and these Jewish people who, when they think of the word vine, they think of themselves. They think of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And here Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. And their minds are kind of being blown right now. There's a lot going on there. And then he's also making this I am statement, which we see in the book of John. Jesus makes several of these I am statements of I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am uh, the bread of life. I am the the living water. All these things. And they're big statements um, that kind of echo God talking to Moses in the burning bush back at the beginning of the Bible. And so that's a big deal. But all of those are a ton of different sermons that we could go into and that I could unpack for a long time. But what I want to primarily highlight is that he's using this picture, painting this picture of, of a vine to give us just a beautiful glimpse of what a daily personal relationship with him looks like. Um, so to, to kind of illustrate this a little more, um, what if I just picked up this guitar and started playing? That'd be funny. I'm going to use this. Um, a plant, biology majors, we're about to freak out. Um, I feel like Ben Fuqua using props on stage. Um, this is good. Okay, so plant, big vine, branches, fruit. We'll pretend these is fruit, but they're leaves, right? He's basically saying, I'm the vine. I'm the main part of this plant, right? You are the branches. Easy enough to understand. Now, if this branch is plucked off of this vine, this leaf isn't going to grow, right? Can we all agree on that? The only reason this leaf grows is because this branch is connected to this thing right here, the main vine, where all the nutrients, all the source of life is, right? So he's saying the same thing of, I am the vine, you are the branches. You can't bear fruit. You can't do any of this. You can't have access to life if you're not tapped into and connected to me. The moment you become disconnected to me, or if you're not disconnected to me, you don't get the benefits of what's in here, right? So another way to think of it, throwing this plant away, is we all have these things in our, in our pocket, right? We're all addicted to them, right? It's called a phone. They're awesome. Um, this phone has a battery in it, and you can use this phone all day, um, and it can last forever, super high capacity, super high functioning. It's pretty incredible. It does a lot. It has Instagram. Again, we're addicted to it. Um, but what do you have to do at the end of every day or in the morning or throughout the day, depending on how addicted you are to this thing? You have to charge it. Yeah. And to charge it, what do you have to do? You get a cable, you connect it, right? And you connect that cable into a power source, right? And that gives, the, gives this, recharges its battery, gives it life. Um, and if it's not connected to it, and if you don't do that, this sucker's just gonna die and it's gonna be pointless to you, right? So it's this idea of, hey, you've gotta connect to something that can fuel you. You've gotta connect to something that will nourish you, connect to something that's actually gonna give you life. Because if you don't, you're just not gonna bear any fruit, right? You're gonna we'll see later, wither away. And so he's painting this picture of like, hey, you're a branch. To bear fruit, you need me. I'm the access to life. I'm the source, the author, the giver of life. That's who I am. So the first way I want you to think of abiding in its simplest form is that abiding is just simply connecting and tapping into that source of life, into Jesus. It's just connection to Jesus. The, uh, the second way to think about it is that abiding is receiving. Um, receiving, right? It's kind of follows suit from connecting to receive all the nutrients in that branch. The branch has, or in the vine, the branch has to be connected to it, right? But then it receives all the nutrients. The phone receives the, uh, the power from, from the outlet or whatever it is. And so the idea is that there is much to receive here. Look at verse, verse seven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you or it will be given to you. And then verse nine goes on and it says, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love, receive my love. And then how we started this in verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So we see this idea that there is something to receive. There is something that Jesus is offering, his love and his joy specifically. And whatever you ask, it will be done for you. It will be given to you. There is something to receive. Um, like I said earlier, I spent a lot of my summers working at, um, a camp and working at Young Life Camp. I was a Young Life leader, which by the way, I, at one point, if you remember this, I said Young Life leaders were synonymous to dirt bags. Um, dirt bag, my definition of dirt bag is not a good for nothing person. Um, but someone who camps and doesn't shower and eats meals in their car because they didn't want to pay for a camping spot and, and 
super outdoorsy term. Um, so I apologize if I called anyone a dirtbag in this room. Um, but I worked at a Young Life camp, and Young Life camp is incredible. It's designed to be the best, most epic week of your life. And Young Life is just this ministry that uh, introduces high schoolers to Jesus and helps them grow in their faith, and, and it's awesome. It was a big part of my life. But camp is this incredible thing. And so you have high school students or middle school students and college students that Young Life is for everyone. It's awesome. Come to this camp, and they're supposed to have the best week of their life. And so everything that happens at camp is designed to accomplish that goal. And you see it in everything that you do from all the activities you're doing, the parties that they throw, um, literally everything. But one of my favorite ways that you see it is at dinner time. The meals are absolutely amazing, but dinner specifically, they go to the nines. They pull out all the stops and it's incredible. They're, the tables, round tables are like uh, covered with a tablecloth. Like the, the plates are literally a specific distance away from the table. The forks and the knives are all set a certain way. Like it's fancy, like it's awesome. And then they serve the like best food you'll ever eat. It's really good food. And there's more of it than you even know what to do with, right? So you're never going to go hungry at Young Life Camp. And it's really awesome. And so I remember one summer, and this happens all the time, and that's kind of why I'm sharing it. Um, but I was in one of the leader kind of debrief hangout things, and we're kind of talking about the day, sharing stories, looking up to what's ahead. And, and I remember one leader was sharing this story. This is at the end of the week about one of the kids that they brought. Um, I'm going to put this leaf back. I keep stepping on it. About one of the students that they brought, and um, at the beginning of the week, this, this student, this guy had come from a really kind of a rough spot. He was kind of a rowdy guy, um, a big personality. And so uh, he comes to Young Life Camp, doesn't have a relationship with Jesus or anything, but the hope and the prayer for this leader is that he does at the end of the week. Um, but long story short, the beginning, the first couple days, this kid isn't acting like himself. And you see it specifically at dinner is what the leader was saying, that he would just sit down at dinner he was pretty reserved, and again, he's a rowdy guy, so that's kind of not normal, and he's just eating, like, enough food and making sure everybody else has enough. He's not even touching dessert. He's not having fun. Like, everybody else is laughing and joking, and it's, it's a rowdy time at, at dinner, but he's just kind of sitting there really reserved and really, like, somber and serious, and so after, like, the second day, the leader goes up to him. And he's like, dude, like, this isn't, this isn't you. Like, what's up? Like, are you not enjoying yourself? Are you not having a good time? Um, and just kind of, you know, probes a little bit and asks him what's happening. And this kid gets a little emotional about it um, and really serious. And he's like, dude, I don't deserve any of this. Like, you're pulling out all the stops for me. This camp is incredible. You're giving me the best food I've ever eaten. Like, this dessert's awesome. Like, all that kind of stuff. Like, the things that we're doing are fun, but I don't deserve any of it. Like, you know where I come from. You know some of the things I've done. You don't even know the half of it. And you're here so that I can develop a relationship with Jesus, but I'm not even sure if I believe any of that stuff. And so he starts unpacking to his Young Life leader that he doesn't feel deserving of any of the stuff that Young Life has to offer and give him, right? And it's supposed to be the best week of his life, and he just feels like he doesn't deserve to experience any of it. And so his Young Life leader just gets to sit there and it tells him, like, dude, like, me, all I want to do, all this camp wants to do, all this ministry wants to do is just show you that you are loved and you are valued no matter what you've done, whether you're deserving of it or not. And if you think that's unreal, then you have a God who loves you infinitely more and who values you infinitely more. And his leader just got to sat, sit there and unpack, and he's telling us about this, that this is for you. Like, enjoy it. Like, it's literally there on the table. Like, there's literally a massive cookie with ice cream on it, literally for you. Like, take the dang cookie, right? Like, who doesn't want that? And, but unpacks all of this for him. And so the leader's telling us that by the end of the week, you started seeing this shift. And by the last day at camp, this kid is joking, you know, fooling around, laughing, eating dessert, asking for more food, and like you see it at dinner most evidently, but he just had a noticeable shift where he's just marked by joy, right? And he started receiving all that Young Life Camp had to offer for him. And I think abiding is very similar. Abiding is receiving all that Jesus has to offer, namely his word, his grace, his truth, his forgiveness, all of that, no matter what you've done, no matter what context you're coming from, Jesus has something for you to offer, his love and his joy in this passage right here. And so abiding is just the act of connecting to him and saying, Lord, like, I want to receive that. Give me your desires. Give me your love. Give me your joy. Like, I know I don't deserve it, but that's, that's the gospel, right? Like, we don't deserve it, but he gives it to us anyways. He loves us despite us. And so abiding is just a simple act of receiving that. Um, believing and trusting that 
all that Jesus has to give. And so that's that. Third way I want you to think about it is abiding. We see all this language of fruit, right? Um, abiding is producing fruit. Abiding is how we make eternal impact is, is kind of what that means. So let's look at verse four, four through five again. Got to flip my page. Uh, verse four, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you produce fruit unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So here he's painting this picture and making it very clear that growing and developing as a follower of Jesus and producing any kind of fruit, making any kind of eternal impact for his name is by abiding, right? And I think, let's, let's talk about this for a second. When we think of fruit, I'm sure we think of a lot of things. Another very Christian-y term, right? We're like, oh yeah, he's bearing fruit. He produces a lot of fruit in his life. And I think it's very easy to think that fruit means, oh yeah, I saved like 300 people today. It was pretty epic. Shared the gospel a million times and they all said yes. And we think that like making eternal impact is doing something along those, those lines, right? That you're crazy evangelistic or whatever it might be that you're sharing uh, the good news with people. But here he's just saying, hey, bearing fruit simply just looks like faithfulness and connecting to me and receiving what I have for you and just being obedient to do that. That is fruitfulness and that is what makes eternal impact. Um, we see fruit defined in another way. Fruit not being evangelizing people and saving souls or whatever. But Galatians 5 verses 22 through 23 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self, self-control, right? Fruit, that is very different than just saying, hey, share the gospel a hundred times, right? Looks very different, especially if you are going on into your next stage of life or going into the summer doing something like working at a Young Life camp or interning at your old church or going to Kaleo or whatever. It's, we should remember what fruit is defined by, right? Your, your fruitfulness, the way I like to think about it and the way a mentor passed it down to me is in your, your faithfulness. Here on our staff too, and you've probably heard Ben say this a lot, but we care about obedience and not effectiveness. And it's this idea of like, man, you can, like the phone, go on all day and you can make your own fruit and produce your own fruit and do things on your own, but it's not going to be true fruit unless you're abiding, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing of value and eternal impact. And so we see this idea of if you want to make eternal impact, then the only way to do that is to abide, to connect and tap into the person who produces fruit in your life and things like love, joy, peace, and all, all these things that are characteristics of Jesus. Um, and doing that is how we develop and grow into the image of Christ. Um, Matthew 7 even says, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Um, and that kind of leads me to the, to the next point, that abiding is also assurance. Here's what I mean by that. Abiding, uh, let's look at verse 8. Uh, verse 8 says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And then in verse 10, he says, if you keep my commandments as a follower of Jesus, you will abide in my love just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So we see this idea that abiding is authenticating, if that's even a word, that you're a follower of Jesus, right? So prove to be a follower of Jesus. And so if you do that, that's what that looks like. It's, it's just this assurance that, yep, I'm glorifying the father, which is the aim of what we do as followers of Jesus, and I'm producing fruit, that is assurance and authenticates that I'm following the way of Jesus. Um, and so we see that there. But in light of that, if you look at verse 6, um, it won't be on the screen, but you see some language in there, and you see it also in verse 2, where it says, If anyone doesn't abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. They're gathered, thrown into a fire, and burned. Um, and verse 2, it says, Every branch of me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. All, all this language that kind of is like a little concerning, right? If we're honest, like what, is, what does that mean? What does he mean by that? And so I want to just give a little caveat on, on those that failing to abide in Jesus does not suggest the possibility of losing your, your salvation. Rather, all of this serves as a reminder that salvation cannot be found anywhere, el- anywhere else but in God, right? And so assurance comes from, man, am I running to God for my salvation, right? And so Psalm 68, 19 through 20, not going to be on the screen, but you can write that down if you want, reminds us that God is our salvation. 
Our God is a God of salvation, and to God, the Lord, belongs deliverances from death. Great piece of scripture. But it proves to remind, and it underscores, and, and reminds us that apart from Jesus, apart from a relationship with Jesus, and believing that Christ loves you and gave himself up for you, and died on a cross, and died the death that you deserve because of your sin. And sin, by the way, not meaning this thing that you do or this behavior, but this condition and disease of your heart. And apart from believing that Jesus' death on a cross and resurrection and life and victory rescues you from that sin, then you're never going to experience the life and the love and the joy that Jesus has on the table for you to op- offering to you, right? Apart from that. But in a relationship with Jesus, by believing that, um, scripture tells us that you're a new creation and you'll experience life forever in a relationship with the God of the universe, experiencing his love, experiencing the fullness of his joy. And in the meantime, before eternity with the God of the universe begins, here and now, tomorrow, today, when you leave this room, experiencing that love, experience that joy looks like abiding, right? Abiding is how we get to experience that love and that fullness of joy, the indestructible kind. Um, but, but let's keep going and talk about what all of this looks like real practically. We can throw those things back on the screen if we want to. Um, abiding is connecting, receiving. It's how we make eternal impact, and it's assurance. Great. Took those notes. Practically, real tangibly, what does that mean, Nathan? Let's, let's unpack that. Um, real practically, the idea of connecting. Let's, let's start with that. If, <clears throat> if connecting is abiding, real tangibly, real, real um, practically, what that looks like is getting in God's word. That's the easiest way to think of abiding. Man, am I abiding? Am I getting in God's word? Am I connecting to the word of God who is living and active? And John 1, 1 at the beginning says the word was God and the word is God, right? Are we connecting to his word? Um, real practically, Ben said it in the welcome something we've got going on this summer is we're going through the Gospels together. And so if you need something to start and you don't know where to start, like what does getting in this word look like, or you want accountability to do that, just follow our Instagram and track along with us and share your thoughts with us if you want to. But that's real practical. Um, One thing that I used to do in the summers just to keep me accountable to it and real easy kind of action item is I would go through a proverb a day and I would match the proverb with the day number. So it's May 1 today, right? It's the first of May. Today, I would read Proverbs 1. May 2nd, I would read Proverbs 2. May 3rd, Proverbs 3, and then so on and so forth because there's 31 of them and so it kind of matches up with every month. Real practically, that's something you can do this summer and you can try. But abiding is getting in his word. And if you're not doing that, you're not tapping into and connecting and receiving all that God has to offer. The second thing, receiving, kind of in light of that, um, real practically looks like simply, church answer, prayer. But specifically, silence and solitude. Um, I didn't mean to talk about Young Life a ton, but I'm going to do it again. Um, When I was on Young Life staff, uh, there was a mentor that sent me this idea and first introduced me to this idea of silence and solitude as a spiritual discipline and as a form of prayer. Typically, when we think of prayer, we sit down and we're either journaling or we sit down and it's like, Lord, give me this. Like, and we make a request to know before God and we should do that. And even in here, we see, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But I think a, a part of prayer that we miss is just simply sitting in silence and solitude. And my, a mentor gave me this idea, this practice called the whole cup is, is what she called it. And this idea was that in the morning or in the afternoon, whenever you drink a cup of coffee, and if you're not into coffee, then you can find something similar and take the principle of it, but challenged me to, when I drink a cup of coffee, have that cup, and for the entire time that I'm drinking it, for the whole cup, I'm just sitting in silence in my chair or in my living room, wherever I'm at, at my table, and I'm just receiving all that the Lord has for me and just letting him speak to me, letting, just creating space to just simply listen, right? And that's something that we don't do often because we're honestly addicted to our phones. We're used to just like asking and doing and going and going, and we don't ever slow down and stop and listen. And so real practically, this idea of the whole cup of until I finish my cup from start to finish, I'm sitting in silence, right? It lasts about five to 10 minutes, depending on how hot your coffee is. Um, But it's this idea of like, man, I'm going to create space to just connect, abide, and receive, right? Real sweet practice. I challenge all of you to do it this summer. Um, but prayer, silence, and solitude, and try that out. Lastly, I think real practically what it looks like 
is the idea of abiding is just simply loving people. We see God say the most important commandments are love God and love people. And earlier in John chapter 13, he kind of repeats the same language that he does here of like, hey, prove to be my disciples. And he says, you're gonna, people are going to know and you're going to prove to be my disciples based on how you love one another. And we see the entire narrative of scripture just calling us to action to love people. Um, by this, you will prove to be my disciples, love people. And we, we love because he first loved us. And there's all this language. And, and even the song we're singing earlier is he's calling us deeper still into love and love and love, love for him and love for other people. Um, and so the challenge is like, okay, how do we love people well? We love the hard to love. We love the unlovely. And we love people when it, even when it's the last thing we want to do, whenever we're frustrated with someone, whenever something's going on or whatever, the easiest way to show that you're a follower of Jesus is to love people, um, which is incredible. So we've got abiding. Abiding is getting in his word. It looks like praying, and it looks like just simply loving people. Um, so hope that's helpful, but here's, here's kind of what I want to leave you with. Again, this is all about continuing in a daily personal relationship with Jesus. Relationship with Jesus, following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, being a Christian isn't just about this, right? It's not just about showing up on a Sunday morning because if that is what it's about, a lot of you aren't going to be here for two or three months, right? Um, and we're taking a break, but it's about a daily personal faithfulness to pursuing a relationship with Jesus. It's daily abiding, daily obedience. Um, and again, this summer, I think, is just a subtly formative time and an opportunity to be able to do that, to make your faith your own authentically and just pursue Jesus. And so my prayer and my hope for all of us in this room is that we would be marked by that, that we would be an abiding people who don't leave joy on the table, but get to connect to it and receive it. Um, and so that's my prayer for all of you today. Um, let me close praying over you. Father, we love you. Father, you are the author and giver of life and love and joy. And Lord, we are just humbled by the fact that, that you, you offer it to us, despite um, the shame and the guilt we might carry, despite what we've done, despite the fact that we just don't flat out deserve it, but we get to experience it anyways. Um, Father, you're good and you're gracious in that way. And Lord, I pray for for everybody in this room, for whatever's next, whether they're just taking a summer break or they're transitioning into the next stage of life, um, Father, I pray that you're with them and you draw near to them and that they would draw near to you. Uh, Father, you, you tell us that when we draw near to you and we draw near to you with our whole heart, we will find you. And that's my prayer for, for all of us in this room, Lord, that we would seek you, we would abide, and, uh, and we would be marked by, by that, by obedience and, and faithfulness. Um, Father, we love you, we need you, and we trust you, and it's your name that we pray. Amen.